Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third and final event in the Rainbows Project's 2021 April Learning Series on Child Abuse Prevention. My name is Jonathan Martinez. I am one of the bilingual child and family therapists at the Rainbow Project, and I will be moderating tonight's event along with my colleague, Monica Madrigal. Uh, we are very excited you could all be with us for this concluding night. As for tonight's presentation, will be given by Fabiola Hamden and Celia Huerta, both of whom we are thrilled to be joined by. Once their presentation is finished, we'll have a short Q&A. Now and to introduce our speakers, I will hand things over to Monica. Thank you, Jonathan. My name is Monica Madrigal, and I'm one of the bilingual adult child and family therapists at the Rainbow Project as well. Thank you all so much for being with us this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenters. Fabiola Hamden is the Immigration Affairs Supervisor at the Dane County Department of Human Services. She provides outreach to immigration, immigrant and refugee communities, which supports immigrant integration to the United States. We are happy Fabiola could be here with us tonight. Presenting along from Viola will be Celia Huerta. Celia is a child and family therapist here at the Rainbow Project. She facilitates a few of our support groups, including Yo Soy, Yo Soy Unica, and the De Mujer a Mujer group. And Celia recently began the Latinx Mental Health Coalition, which aims to provide mental health resources and therapy to Spanish-speaking families. We are very grateful for Celia and Fabiola for speaking with us tonight. And with that, we will hand things over to Fabiola and Celia for their presentation, a protective factors approach in working with Latino populations. Hola, buenas noches o buenas tardes. My name is Fabiola Hamden, and I am so thrilled to be here tonight, especially because I have the privilege and honor to work with Cheryl Cattle, Celia Huerta, Monica, and Jonathan, who I think in my list to call every day because uh, of the work, the wonderful work that Rainbow Project does. I know it's uh, Wednesday afternoon after the nice weather yesterday, now we're here. So I, I am kind of okay that the weather got a little cold. So maybe we can, you know, we have more of you, but uh, it, it is hard. I think at this point as service providers, we are really zoom out. Uh, because we have meetings after meetings. And I just wanted to thank you for being with us. So with that, I, uh, Celia and I, uh, we go a long, long ways away. Uh, we work together closely. And uh, if you think about closely, it's like phone calls away, right? Either after hours or early in the morning. I think we uh, develop this uh, sort of uh, work friendship and also friendship because we have a lot of cases in common. So our presentation today, it's about child abuse in the Latino families. And more than anything, we wanna share with you our experience, what we have seen and what we are gonna see along the lines. So again, uh, my job as an immigration affairs supervisor, um, this uh, unit started about three years ago and my uh, main job is to connect people with immigration resources. For example, if somebody, I just got a phone call like two, five minutes ago about a Venezuelan family that just arrived to Madison and uh, they are asylum seekers and they arrived to friend's house and they need to connect with immigration or the ICE office. So that's very scary, right? Because you have to connect with them and so my, uh, you know, myself and I have a social worker um, that helps me doing this, Gisenia Villarpando. So tomorrow we're gonna call ICE and then we're gonna connect them and see what are the next steps. So uh, in a nutshell, our job is just to connect people with uh, immigration resources, meaning immigration attorneys, meaning uh, any resources we have in town. Celia Huerta, she's the bilingual child, adult, and family psychotherapist at the Rainbow Project. Celia is a, a person that um, this community will need maybe maybe 20 Celias to kind of gap and the needs that we have in the community because she, um, from the get-go, um, doesn't have boundaries about helping people and really connecting people in a holistic way. So uh, we have an outline for you guys, but I, as you read the outline, I just wanted to tell you that 
Today, we are going to share with you some of our experiences, like I said, working with the Latinx community or Latino community. Although Celia and I are Latinas, we are very different, right? So always remember that, even in my family, uh, you know, my, my sister, my brother, we're so different. So we are not just one Latino uh, people. And so there are differences like in any other culture. So um, the examples that we are gonna share with you does not represent all Latinos. This is just uh, some um, of our experiences that we are gonna share with you and then usually the people that we work with are usually very vulnerable. Uh, people that are really in need of services. So uh, that's something that you have to put in context. Um, if you have questions, comments, and, and anything that we don't cover tonight, please let us know. If we don't have the answer to your questions, we will find it for sure. Um, so we thought we'd just like to start the presentation with some facts about Latinos, queer, and then I'm sure by seeing, you know, all of you tonight, you already know this, but this is just kind of to put us in, in, in the mood of talking about Latinos in the USA, right? We are uh, 60 million Latinos in the US, 37 million uh, Mexicanos. Uh, we're the largest minority in the United States and largest Spanish speaking country in the world after Mexico. So another fact that we wanted you to kind of take um, tonight is that we are four in five Latinos are United States citizens. One out of four children in United States are Latino children and then 71% of Latinos ages five and older speak English. Uh, the Hispanic children make up about 11.6% of the population in Wisconsin. And uh, something that I always remember from people talking to us was that, uh, you know, we are a very young generation. So the United States Anglo community is aging, but we are, um, you know, this population is younger and younger. We have families with very small children. And so that's something that uh, you have to remember. Uh, I was kind of just checking about Wisconsin and we are about 11 million uh, undocumented people in, in this in United States, hoping for a, a change in our broken immigration system. Wisconsin has 5,822,434 Latinos. And then country, I just saw this, it's 37,763. But all these numbers would not mean a lot because a lot of our people do not, uh, are not being counted with the census just because of um, uh, immigration fears and all of that. So with that, I'm gonna pass uh, the next slides to Celia. Thank you. Why in general do care caretakers abuse their, their children? Adults who suffer severe mental illness and or substance abuse issues and adults who have histories of child abuse, um, severe histories of emotional, physical, sexual, spiritual abuse or severe neglect have um, higher tendencies to repeat the, the cycles with their, with their children or other vulnerable people. And it makes sense uh, when we think about the effects of severe mental illness and child abuse on the frontal lobe, uh, the executive function area that is in charge of thinking of consequences, impulse control, and emotional regulation. So I'm not sure how many of you were in previous uh, workshops, but you, you probably heard um, a little bit about these statistics. And so for caretakers with these issues, frequently knowing that abusing a child is wrong may not be enough, right? Uh, and parents with histories of abuse are four times more likely to abuse their own children. Um, most abuse also begins with corporal punishment. And so for these reasons, it's very important that people with these types of patterns receive the mental health um, treatment services that they need. And we know too that there are um, environmental risk factors 
that can also have an impact and increase risks for, for child abuse. And some of these include poverty and unemployment, uh, wars, natural disasters, and uh, living in dangerous neighborhoods. It also increases uh, chances of severe neglect, physical abuse, and uh, sexual victimization on children. So for uh, many immigrants, including Latino immigrants, there are additional risk factors for child maltreatment. We know that uh, immigrants, when they come to the United States, lose connections to close relatives, and in some cases, even uh, children, parents, right, siblings. And so this can cause uh, a pretty deep grief, and at times, uh, these relationships um, are severed, right? Um, parents sometimes think they're coming to the United States for a couple of years, and then two years as they realize that it's not as easy to to save money um, or send enough money to build a little house or to save to open a business two years end up um, turning into 10 years and uh, children in their home countries oftentimes develop feelings of of hurt and abandonment resentment and so this can be really hard for for the parents who are living here it's not uncommon for um, for parents to have additional children in the United States, and so it's we I see a lot of um, a lot of uh, clients, especially moms, who deal with this kind of grief um, in a, in in an unending way. It can be pretty tough. Um, racism and discrimination experiences and these issues really increased and got pretty badly um, in the past uh, or the last four years during the because of the political climate um, at the time. Um, but you know we know that these are ongoing issues as well, unfortunately. Um, and because of again systemic discrimination and just cultural differences, language differences, Many Latinos are isolated, uh, they feel marginalized, and, um, and, and because they feel disconnected from, uh, from the community, from uh, systems, uh, also due to uh, lack of trust because of um, past uh, negative experiences with, with services, they tend to, to uh, lack that additional support. Also, uh, differences in acculturation between parents and children can cause a lot of conflicts where kids uh, that are growing up in the United States are adopting more uh, dominant culture values um, and um, Latinos, traditional Latinos, um, may expect their kids to continue to behave um, in, way, in the same ways that they, they were taught um to behave like for example girls um if the parents come from small towns they may expect the their girls to be virgins until they get married and to take care of the children or their siblings and to be obedient um and not to talk back to the parents or uh, adult figures authority figures while in the dominant culture um people are um, encouraged to be more assertive and independent and so that can cause a lot of clashes in the relationships and uh, we know that Latinos and other immigrants right um, tend to have higher tendencies of being exploited exploited at the workplace including uh, not getting their wages paid uh, not being offered benefits working very long hours etc and so um, and, and again, you know, even though Latinos can hold two and at times even three jobs, um, they we tend to or they tend to get paid uh, lower wages as well. Um, and so all of these issues uh, definitely add, um, are a source of added stress for Latino families who may already have um, a lot uh, of issues on on their plate, especially families who come from other countries escaping from uh, violence 
war, uh, extreme poverty, etc. And then for um, Latino parents, um, uh, it's not uncommon for them to use corporal punishment and, and attempt to teach their kids to behave so they don't get in trouble with uh, school teachers or with the law. Um, I've had uh, clients who get calls from the school counselor or the teacher and uh, the school staff is only intending to communicate or let the parent know of what's happening uh, with the kid at school. And it's not uncommon for them to assume that the school wants uh, the parent to take care of the behavior, to ensure that it doesn't happen again and to punish the child. Um, and so sometimes the parents will use corporal punishment and they may be shocked when they get into trouble for administering this punishment. And so as if that weren't enough, uh, with the pandemic, things have really taken a turn for a lot of, of people. Things have gotten a lot more complicated um, with um, the, the pandemic. Again, we have um, uh, statistics that are, are pretty alarming and pretty concerning. Um, where Latinos are overly represented in, in industries that have been hit harder by the, by the pandemic. And, you know, we're talking about like factories, right? Um, and service jobs where they're in the front, they're dealing with people. And at times they're not provided with the, the safety procedures where they're not enforcing um, these um, mandated practices for safety. And so Latinos accounted for 23% of the initial job loss, job loss, while uh, the main population um, accounted for 16%. Hispanics and Latinos are also 1.7 times more likely to contract COVID-19, 4.1 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID, and 2.8 times more likely to die from COVID. Um, and, and so um, given the statistics I've shared, it's, it's no surprise that they're more likely to experience food insecurity and housing insecurity. Um, Latinos are also the largest uninsured group in the United States, uh, despite, um, again, the fact that most of us are, are citizens and uh, that uh, they, they hold oftentimes more than one job. And so uh, that's also been a, a, a health risk for this population and contributes to, again, the higher rates of death during the, the pandemic. And so we have seen that in our client population. I've ha I have had all of the clients that have, my clients that have gotten COVID are uh, Latino, children uh, as young as as two years of age and um and there have been a couple of deaths not not any of my clients but relatives and so many of my clients are um experiencing grief thank you celia i just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, dane county right uh we're witnessing every day the hardship of many dane county latinos facing uh, this pandemic, um, you know, we daily have individuals, families, and the entire community uh, sharing their stories about struggles with access to safe and affordable housing, food insecurity, concerns over health and safety, and the job, limited access to testing, healthcare, and mental health. Unfortunately, for our undocumented people, that's not something easy to navigate. Uh, concerns about their children, education. So I remember that, you know, uh, when the pandemic hit us, we were not ready and we were sent home and we um, uh, tried to accommodate for our kids in whatever way we could. But, um, you know, I keep thinking about my families that don't have the computers, don't have the fast internet, and you know the language buried in top of that. So um, 
it's uh, unbelievable how we are still surviving this mm -hmm. crisis. And, you know, this uh, is going to leave a huge gap. We already had a gap in education for our Latino children. Now the, the gap is higher. The information about the virus that can help guide, you know, our social distancing, personal issues that we had. Um, so many, many things came to us at once. We were not prepared as, you know, how uh, pandemics are. So uh, then the Latino Consortium for Action, uh, which is a coalition of leaders representing different Latinx uh, aid organizations, professional associations, and educational groups here in, in Den County, we created an emergency uh, relief fund. One, because um, undocumented people don't have the luxury to apply for the stimulus check. Second, uh, many of us could work from home, make accommodations, and they couldn't do that. So uh, immediately we created this fund. We got about a million uh, plus dollars. And we, this is all as we speak, right? We like uh, kind of reacting to the effects of the pandemic. Um, so we were able to distribute uh, $500 for individuals and $1,000 for the household. And then also Latino um, um, businesses were getting some money. So everything was uh, really chaos, but we at least were able to help. And then we had, you know, agencies like, uh, I don't know, MGE, United Way and, and the county, the city, pouring in resources so we could do this job. And... Um, so with that, I just I just wanted to add that to, the, to what happened here in COVID-19 in Dane County. So uh, because of my job, I need to talk to you about immigration, right? Law enforcement and immigration laws and the impact that this has in our Latino families. As you read my bullet points, I just want to give you some examples in how uh, law enforcement and immigration um, really affects our families. Uh, uh, for example, I wanted to tell you, I'm gonna change names. Um, there was one, um, this case maybe came to me about six years ago. There was this Latino family that I was working with and then the husband and, and wife had a uh, disagreement. They were in the second floor, husband pushed wife and uh, the neighbors next door called the police because they were, you know, hearing some shouting and in this argument. So the police gets there, uh, arrests the husband, and then takes him to county jail, right? So from county jail, um, he gets uh, um, ICE detention hold. And uh, for him to get out of this, like, um, I think it was, it wasn't even domestic violence. It was just like the, you know, disturbance or something. It was going to be about $75 fine. And then he was going to go to court and then he was going to be discharged. But ICE was there and then pick him up. So now he's in ICE detention. So we have three kids, no job. Uh, one of the children receiving uh, uh, birth to three services and uh, the income was cut right away. Uh, so it was uh, the first time I saw that, how we could handle the situation better. When I got there, you know, it was kind of too late because the husband is already in detention in ICE. So then, you know, provide for the family, who's gonna pay the rent, utilities, who's gonna take the kids to this special needs. Wife didn't have a job, just, coming from Mexico, she was from a very rural area, didn't know anything about medicine. And although what happened between him was not okay, we should report all these issues, right? But I think he got to the extreme where the husband got deported and wife ended up staying with the three kids. So as you know, all of you service providers, uh, you know, that time it was like my full-time job to provide for the kids, therapies, rent, uh, basic needs. So that really kind of, I want to illustrate kind of the broken system we have. Anyways, he was deported and in six months he was back and 
and now uh, you know they are together. So the other example I want to give you here is that uh, one day I received a phone call from a 12 year old. He went with his dad to an immigration appointment and the dad said, wait for me. Uh, if I don't come out in a couple hours, then call Fabiola or the relatives because I, you know, maybe I, I will be detained and put in, in uh, ICE detention. And uh, so if I don't come back, just call. Locally, the kid called me, you know, like 20 minutes into this process. And I just wanted to tell you that moment, uh, you know, he's 12 and he's putting in this responsibility to, you know, kind of wait for the dad. I'm sure that the 12 minutes that passed by him, it was hours just to see the dad coming back to the car with his waiting for him. And just, I mean, that picture never leaves me. I always remember that. So I just want to give you an example of that. I have another example about a DACA holder. Uh, she's a, a really uh, amazing girl. DACA receivers, they still undocumented. So DACA uh, recipients can, get, can stay in this country with a special permission because they were brought to this country by the parents without their kind of knowledge or being okay so but every two years they have to do a renewal okay so my bright DACA recipient is you know finally she gets the DACA she has a driver's license she has a work permit and then she end up going to UW in Milwaukee so she's driving and then suddenly she tells me that she saw a, a, a sheriff car behind her immediately she slowed down and then she find the nearest exit and she exits the highway. And uh, after she exits and she's all shaken up and then kind of trying to get herself together, she realizes, oh my God, I have a driver's license. I have DACA, what the heck am I doing? So she goes back to the, to the highway. So just to you know, make you think about you know, how traumatic it is to live as an undocumented, even though, you know, having a DACA and stuff like that, it doesn't matter. And my final uh, example is about after um, a couple of years ago, we had a, a raid, uh, ice raid here in, in Wisconsin. And then in Dane County, we had about 24 people uh, detained by ice. So one of the families, uh, when, you know, the dad was detained and we were working in the whole thing. Um, so after like months, uh, mom calls me and, and she's like, you know, my five-year-old cannot go outside and play with the other kids and say, you know, why, what's happening? She goes, she's very, he's very afraid of the police, the friends, you know, I can just picture he's in the second floor and the friends are like, Hey, come let's play. And he's like, no, I am afraid that the police is going to come and detain my parents. So I tell you all of this because uh, uh, law enforcement immigration gets, you know, it's, it's really different from the countries we come from. Law enforcement is very different than here. And now, you know, actually right now in this country, we are living a unique time when, you know, we're having all these shootings and killings and all of that. So it's very traumatic. And if it is traumatic for us, you can imagine how much is for our kids. And then the final thing I wanted to tell you, I, I'm sorry if I depress your afternoon, but it's just like, you know, what's happening right now, the immigration crisis at the border, right? You know, these parents are getting uh, uh, their children to come alone. So, uh, and I, like I tell you at the beginning of my, uh, the presentation, this is just our experience. And many people, including, you know, dear friends, relatives that I have, everybody's like, how can these parents let their kids come in, you know, cross the border alone? And, you know, what the heck, what's happening with them? So one thing I have to tell you is that about three years ago, I was able to go to El Salvador in uh, the sister cities uh, to Arcatao. And I, I, I can, I am witness about how gang poverty, um, gang involvement, poverty, um, 
really pushes people to get their kids in the border and look for a new future. Even now with the climate change issues that are happening, we don't think uh, about you know, the Central American countries suffering all this uh, weather you know, changes that are happening. Look at for us, yesterday 80, today is you know, 40 and all of that, you know, all their crops, their, their farms and everything that are producing anything. And it's not like here that they can go to the Latino Chamber of Commerce and apply for a grant. Over there, there's nothing. For a parent to decide to get their child travel alone, it has to take a lot. And I can tell you, if that's the only choice you have, I, I am sure you'll do it. So right now, for all of our service providers, we have to be looking into this uh, closely. And then we have to also be prepared because these kids are going to come. We have, I have in my case law two kids, and I know they're going to have some trauma issues about crossing countries. And and you know, and you know, news is sensationalist. And news is news, right? But I can tell you that that's going to be a, a, a we're going to have these big effects in the county and the whole uh, United States. So let's be together, let's be prepared, and let's be welcoming to these kids that are just looking for a chance. Oof, that was a lot in one one slide. Um, so I think the next one is mine. Uh, with that, I think I just, uh, we have to go into this protective factor approaches, right? We're talking about that tonight, that's our, our team. So it's, um, you know, uh, cultural competency and cultural humble services are really key element in the work we do every day, especially right now with our Latino families. Let's become culturally competent. And, you know, how do I become a cultural competent? I was saying, because I always say, you know, do this, do that. So I was invited to be part of a panel and a meeting in the Tibetan um, uh, community here in, in, in Den County. And I, I had no idea that existed, but there is. So now I have to be culturally, um, uh, I have to have cultural humility mm -hmm. to really say people, I, I don't know about your culture, teach me. And I don't know, I mean, I have to be transparent and, and have uh, know my limitations. I think cultural competency is a really um, must, especially for service providers, especially if you're working with the immigrant community, not only the Latino community, but the immigrant community. We need to be very competent on that. And it's not just like, I care people, I love people, I love to help kids. It's about us to really immerse ourselves into that culture and experience. Experience working with people, experience by going to their uh, festivals and things like that. We're gonna talk about that later on. But really, and uh, you don't know, sometimes I uh, end up working um, with colleagues that are eminent social workers and you know been doing this job. And then sometimes when they do the questions to about how, did, why did you come to the United States? I mean, what, what is that question? Why would you ask, why did you come to you? in the first interview, right? There are ways in, in which you can get that answer. Or, I mean, I have many examples. So, but tonight we wanted to hear from you. So I'm not gonna expand on that. So we have focused a lot on, um on risk factors, right? Um, and after, you know, hearing um, so, so many negative issues that Latinos um, experience, or a lot of Latinos experience, uh, you may wonder like, okay, how is it, you know, um, how is it that they're, that they're here? How do they go on, right? But we do have a lot of strengths. Um, and the, our biggest strength our biggest protective factor is our strong inclination and value for community and family support. We, um, 
we um, our, our boundaries tend to be more flexible in when it comes to financial uh, support or help, uh, social, emotional support, child care, and decision making. Um, we're there for one another. And um, f for for this um, for this reason, we tend to have lower rates of severe mental illness. Latinos do have higher rates of depression, anxiety, or PTSD. But you 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 won't hear um, diagnoses like um, dissociative identity disorder or schizophrenia as much as you do uh, in the dominant population. And our lifespan is also longer than our white counterparts parts for this reason. Another very important protective factor is um, the fact that uh, Latinos are predominantly uh, religious, Catholic, Christians, and, uh, and this helps in terms of making meaning of adversity um, and having faith, um, hope. Uh, praying can be a form of, of meditation right and uh, retreats attending church and and um, church events creates a sense of community so cultural strengths that are beneficial for the development of latino children um, need to be taken into strong account in early childhood education and development programs educators community organizations should target programs to the family, including the extended family when possible, and to mothers and caregivers and fathers as important decision, decision makers. And of course, not all, like Fabiola said, not all Latino families are the same. There are different acculturation levels, right? Different socioeconomic statuses, educational levels, etc. And, you know, and Latinos come from many different countries. Um, this is again just uh, referring to uh, traditional Latino families that uh, follow somewhat the, the pro-social gender expectations, um, including uh, ma pro-social machismo and marianismo, where the head of the family, decision maker, protective and provider uh, is the, the the father and mom is the nurturer, the the person who teaches culture and religion and helps in the community is is the the mother, the Latina mom. So coordination with local religious institutions and other agency service providers is also very important to ensure that religious beliefs, cultural values, and trust issues uh, given negative experiences with systems are also considered in program development. And it's also very, very important um, to ensure access to support and services, uh, emphasizing uh, norms of shared responsibility for supporting parents and families um, in terms of implementing uh, cultural specific and evidence-based practice. So it's, it's important that in agencies um, or in organizations, it's not just your, um, your Latino or Latina uh, social worker or psychotherapist that is doing all the work with uh, Latino families, right? Everybody needs to be involved. Again, this has to be a shared responsibility and not just um, in single agencies or organizations, but just across systems, right? We all need to to work together um, and share the responsibility. So the, the first step toward helping immigrant caretakers reduce their use of co corporal punishment is to gain their buy-in to the fact that corporal punishment is not good for their kids. All of these approaches, of course, have to be combined with cultural and linguistic competence, as Fabiola said, compassion and empathy, right? And we did talk about where these behaviors are, are rooted, usually in extreme suffering, as I mentioned earlier. We also need to 
provide concrete assistance uh, in resolving issues um, with housing, employment, healthcare, and schooling, childcare that our clients may be experiencing. And again, sometimes providing referrals only like or giving um, phone numbers may not be enough to a population that um, has a history of um, being discriminated and um, oftentimes exploited in different situations. So informing caretakers that corporal punishment is increasingly discouraged not just in the USA, um, is important. Um, worldwide, corporal punishment is increasingly seen as a violation of children's rights. And there's actually a website, and it's it's up on that board, um, from, from the all corporal and all corporal punishment of children, where you can actually see a map and you can click on the, the different countries to see where they're at in terms of their laws. So you can see many Latino countries are part of this, of this work um, in terms of um, ending abuse um, toward children. Also, uh, talking about the negative effects of corporal punishment um, is, is helpful with Latino families. Um, they want good things for their children. Again, we're a, a, a population that is strongly inclined um, toward uh, the family. And um, and so this, this can be a very effective approach. Also talking about different alternatives to corporal punishment and helping caretakers empathize with their child's perspective um asking questions like have you ever felt trapped or have you ever felt scared of the person that that you expected to protect you um can can you imagine or have you ever been in a situation like that in talking about corporal punishment right is important as well and calling it what it is like instead of saying uh, did you um touch your child or unintentionally, it's okay to say when, you know, this like when you hit your child on the mouth or, um, and try not to minimize the behavior, but, you know, be respectful um, and, and be direct. Thank you, Celia. I'm taking notes. So I think um, now, um, also, I want to share some other recommendations, you know, following what Celia was saying. And uh, I cannot emphasize more about the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the people that we're talking to you about are so resilient. Uh, I had a nurse calling me and saying that, you know, I do, there were some issues about this person getting to the appointment, but everything was set up. And the one thing that came to my mind, I was like, okay, this person crossed three countries to get here to United States. I am sure with, you know, all the help we've given to him, he's going to be able to make it. Don't worry, just wait a little bit. So he, he's going to be able to make it. So I tell you this uh, sort of kind of in a joking way, but it's serious, right? I mean, the resiliency that um, we talk about is really real. And um, I'm not going to go through one by one about this because I know all of you know all of this about recommendations working with Latino families. But one thing that I wanted to emphasize with you is the trust, confianza, trust. If you have la confianza or the trust for the families that you are working with, you have it all. How many times we get... Uh, uh, agencies and people saying, hey, you know, we have this program for Latino moms and Latino children or whatever. We have childcare, we have food, we have transportation, we have this and that. And then they're not coming. They're not coming because they don't trust you. Even as the Latina, Celia and I, we have to gain the trust for, for our community. So anytime that now, you know, we have radio programs, we have all kinds of stuff, but 
even now, you know, it's just like, you know, that's why I'm very careful. If anything I'm gonna say to the Latino community, it has to be worth the trust. So, you know, um, it, you know we, we, we talk about many times about like, don't use the kids as a translators, you know, build that rapport with the, with the people, be transparent. Uh, you know, and then always, uh, you know, uh, people are going to be asking you about self-disclosure, right? So do you have kids? And, you know, so all these things, I think it's it's worthwhile to look at it and then think about it. And and if you don't want to do any of these things, are, there are ways in which you could say, hey, you know, because of my job, I cannot really tell you if I am married, not married or whatever. But you know, like how about if we concentrate in, in your in, in, in you because I am here for you. So you know uh, so there are ways in you uh, in, in, um, in, there are ways that you could um, um, navigate this. So I didn't want to go into all of this because I am very sure that all of you know this. And if you don't, we're here, Sally and I can, can talk to you. <laughs> Again, you know, this is uh, the cultural recompense services. That, okay, so, you know, number one, applying for documentation status is not easy. Immigration is so complicated, you guys. It took me about nine years to become a permanent resident. I mean, a US citizen. So I came to this country, I had to go, you know, step by step. And not only that, you know, every step you take to become a US citizen is costly. And before we could do it ourselves, now we're advising everybody to do it with the attorney, especially when we had the previous administration. You know, I think every day they did something that will make this impossible. Not, you know, and we don't know about, you know, we just hear the head highlights, you know, banning Muslims and wanted to end DACA and stuff like that. But in between of that, I mean, there, there has been many things and uh, and we're very hopeful that, um, you know, with the Biden administration, we are seeing uh, some improvement in that. So applying for documents is not easy because, you know, a lot of people come here um, with different status, right? Somebody just decides to cross the border. And then, you know, who crossed the border? Mexico. Mexico is right there. United States, Mexico, it makes sense, right? It, it, it's not easy, but you know, that's, you know. And, and then we have Canada, and then we have the European countries like, you know, coming, uh, but they can blend better, not bashing anybody, but they can blend better and they are not, you know, like scrutinized, like the brown, faces and stuff like that. We have a student's visa, tourist visa. Um, um, they can stay here for a certain period of time. If you're a F1 student, you're here to study. And then, you know, if your wife, husband comes, you have the F1-2 visa. So these are limited times that you can stay in this country. We have right now the refugee and asylum seekers. Refugees, are people that are displaced from their home countries. We have millions of them out there waiting for the United States to say, yes, you can come in. So they can come in in, a, in a good conditions because they will have some benefits. They can apply for jobs. They can get some uh, food stamps. They can get some benefits. Asylum seekers, they, you know, you've been seeing they knock at the door of United States. Hey, can we come in? And you know, because they are already in, in United States soil, we should be able to get them as asylum seekers. But you know, uh, with previous administrations, we were uh, you know that administration say, okay, yeah, sure. Why don't you wait? Get a number, and that number that you get, uh, it was uh, for you to wait for between six to one to two years in a foreign country like Mexico. So it's not easy. So number two, help families to plan in advance, very important, especially when it comes to immigration. I had clients that, you know, mom or dad was gonna be deported. We had to plan through power attorneys and all of that. 
Uh, and always, if you work with a, a Latino family, make a plan. I have, we have created a tool in Spanish that you can use that. Number three, connect to Latino community groups. Um, you know, come to the soup, the third Wednesday of the month. Uh, we get these meetings together. We have the Latino Children Families Council, the Latino Health Council, the Latino Education Council. I talked to you about the Latino, um, uh, the LCA. So all of that, I, especially, you know, because we are here to really work with you. So just connect with us, connect, connect, and we should be able to do a difference among us and between all of you. And the last thing I wanna say, Celia, is that we need you because you are our allies. You are the, the people that stay here on a Wednesday night until 6.30 with us and hear us. And, and you know, that, that means the world. So um, I'm gonna have Celia talk about the last slides. So we wanna share some resources with your community resources um, for um, moms, Latina moms. Um, there's the, the Mujer a Mujer support group that I facilitate through the Rainbow Project. And it's a, um, a weekly um, continuous group. People do have to go through a screening process and it's a, a process group where women talk about their experiences, their difficulties. They listen to one another and they share uh, feedback, supportive feedback. They also uh, consult about any issues that they want to consult in terms of uh, healthy versus unhealthy behaviors, parenting, uh, coping strategies. And we uh, invite uh, other service providers from the community from time to time who talk about important topics for the women in the group. Um, and we um, also get referrals from clinics, social service agencies, school social workers, et cetera. And so some of the, the community uh, guests or service providers that we've had um, include people from Danes, the Department of Civil Rights, the Tenant Resource Center, uh, worker rights, consumer protection, UNIDO, CPS, etc. And currently we are still meeting via telehealth. And um, surprisingly to me, the, uh, there has been no change in terms of the, how long the group has been and people have been attending pretty regularly. And we also have uh, the Platicas, which is a collaboration of service providers in the community that includes Fabiola, myself, and uh, people from the YWCA uh, and other Dane County social workers, Unidos, and many other agencies. And so we facilitate platicas once a month, and these are uh, workshops where both um, men and women can attend, Latino women and Latino men can attend um, these meetings. And these are focused on current events that are happening. For example, we uh, we we held a platica um, of uh, focusing on COVID and what it is and how to keep safe and how to connect to resources and coping, uh, dealing with uh, children at home and things like that. We also, um, during the ice raids, we also held a, a workshop focused on that and coping and uh, rights, um, and um, etc. Uh, we also have under the the Latino um, Formando Los Familiares, which is the organization that does uh, platicas. Uh, we do radio novelas, which are um, radio soaps and so it's a, a an educational um way of or an educational media um to, that reaches people who listen to the radio who like um soaps or novelas are very very popular in latino culture and so it's a very effective way of reaching out to uh, families that uh, either don't have transportation or Again, they have uh, trust issues with systems. 
and so it's a very effective um, way of of sharing information and then we have the brown bags we haven't held those since the pandemic but we plan on continuing those when when things change and so i think time is pretty much up there is a question about the mujer group is it that rainbow right now it's virtual right now the group is virtual we are meeting via zoom and so as i as i said uh the women do need to go through a screening process for you know just to to talk about what the group is like talk about confidentiality uh kind of start building that relationship in case they they have any questions or concerns or fears um and so they just need to contact me and so I just want to read um, a comment here that is important and it's, a, it's responding to um, the question about where the Mujer a Mujer support group takes place when, not, when, when we're not, you know, not during the pandemic. So the group does take place at the Rainbow Project in person and we provide childcare. Um, yeah, it is just this last year that we went virtual, but the group has been going on for about 10 years. So there's one more question here. How many women attend the, the Mujer a Mujer group? Very good question. Mm -hmm. So because it is like an ongoing group, we meet every Friday from four to six and uh, it is ongoing. And so the, the, some of the women that attend the group have been attending for many years. Some of them are newer. And so they come um, as their schedule and as their um, demand, life demands allow. There are a lot of women that I write letters to, so their bosses kind of change their schedule around. But uh, currently I have a total of 13 women and there's an average of um, about seven women who attend the group regularly. I mean, um, like there's usually seven women in the group and it could be um, a mix of these 13. The visa process sounds expensive. Are there many financial assistance programs to help pay for the legal costs? Absolutely. So any immigration uh, application has, it's expensive. So fortunately, uh, Dane County, we have a budget to help people that cannot pay for the their filing applications, uh, they can connect with us. The only thing that we cannot do is pay private attorneys. Other than that, we can do um, as many, I mean, we can try to help, you know, even with rent and, you know, utilities. And uh, we try to do a holistic approach to immigration services. We have been able to get some donations and we will do whatever is possible to get the person assistance in their immigration situation. Despite the many challenges and good reasons not to trust, Latino families often risk reaching out to connect and become involved with community resources due to their often fierce devotion and caring for their children when children are victims of sexual abuse, witness domestic violence, or uh, child abuse. Do we observe this resilience as well? Most definitely. Yeah, um, this job can be difficult um, at times, but it, it really is inspiring and it is amazing the strength and, and you know, just the, the resilience that this population has. Um, and again, the, the lengths that the parents, you know, will reach um, to help their kids. You know, Latino parents um, don't want to hurt their kids. Uh, they want good things for their kids. And, and they do work very, very hard to give them a better future. So yes, a lot of families and um, do go very far um, and take a lot of risks despite the issues with trust. And this next question, what's the best way to open up a dialogue with clients about their concerns with immigration? Our agency wants to be able to support clients that might have needs related to that, 
I don't want to make assumptions either. I want to be sensitive to how much a risk clients are taking in disclosing status. So here's the thing. Uh, sometimes we wanted to help people and we can do more damage than help. So it is very important that we check with each other so right now we have the Immigration Affairs Office, that's myself and the social worker, always check with us because we, get, we have uh, tons of attorneys that uh, we can ask the question. And um, just a quick example, we had uh, somebody in one of the hospitals that wanted to help the person with their immigration status. And she ends up calling immigration, which was like, not at this stage, you don't call immigration until we have the, so, you know, we could do more harm than help. And now hearts are in the right place. So always connect with us. We can like, uh, I'm, I'm not an immigration attorney, but we have some good immigration attorneys that can guide us in that direction. So can we talk more about the importance of interpreters being bicultural, perhaps examples of when it has worked or has not worked when the interpreter was not bicultural and defining being a cultural ambassador for clients? Excellent question. Uh, yeah, it is extremely important to have um, competent, trained interpreters, right? It is very important not to use children. That was on a, a recommendations for working with Latino clients list and that was highlighted and underlined because um, for many people that might be an obvious thing, uh, but uh, some people, for other people, it hasn't been. I have seen therapists, uh, psychi psychiatrists who use children as interpreters and their answer uh when asked you know why they were doing that they you know they did say like i don't know how to access an interpreter or i didn't think there was anything wrong or for the sake of time and so it's really important to um do a good job interviewing interpreters it's very important to make sure that their second language is also being um assessed and not to just take people's word for it. I'm going to give you an example of um, a time when I, um, I took a client with borderline personality features. Um, I needed to uh, transfer her uh, because of her insurance and because she needed psychiatric treatment. And um, so I did go along with her and they assigned her to a therapist that was supposedly bilingual. And when I got there, um, when we got there, I found out um, there and then that she did not speak Spanish fluently. And I ended up serving as an interpreter for a, um, an appointment through the crisis unit. Um, we have had, yeah, we've, we've seen it, you know, and not, not just in the mental health field, but also, um, through the police department, you know, people not knowing how to access interpreters, not knowing how to access the interpreter line. And, uh, even through the interpreter line, um, and I have seen it, I have heard it, um, even though, um, like the the interpreter was bilingual like her spanish was good her english was good but culturally she was pretty cold kind of um just culturally she she didn't have it like um the way she was interpreting um and and uh it also not offering any information in terms of the culture to the Mm -hmm. I, think, I think Celia, that's very, very, very important to see because there are levels of interpreting, right? So in a personal level, I will tell you that in hospitals, they have the, you know, the interpreters that are trained 
and medical terminology, which I don't have. So personally, if I take my dad or my mom, you know, it's hard for me to, to do that, in, that interpretation, right? But at the same time, I think it's important that especially agencies, you know, big agencies, look into this biculturalism. It's super important to have that. But I, you know, I just wanted to validate what you are saying because interpretation is really hard. And even, you know, with my parents, you know, I have to do the Bolivian style, right? So they can understand the terminology the interpreter is doing. So it's interpretation after the interpreter. Many of our people don't have that. Another thing that I want to add that is, um kind of related to you, the use of interpreters is when t and or how to determine when a um, a client or um, a, 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 a Latino person needs an interpreter. Um, there was this policeman that made a, a decision that the, the person that I referred to for help there did not need an interpreter he decided that uh this that this latino man's english was good enough and it was really interesting he, he didn't call an interpreter and so then this this man called me and said i think this cop is racist and i mean the his perception of that interaction was completely different than than uh, what the policeman told me. And I, I knew for a fact that this, this client did not speak English very well. Like he, it was pretty broken and he did not feel um, treated um, respectfully. He didn't he feel heard, understood and valued. And so I went back and I talked to the policeman and and I uh, explained what happened and then he did make repairs, uh, which was a good thing. But if I hadn't been in the picture, kind of uh, mediating and just there, and if I didn't have a relationship with this client, a trusting relationship where he could call me back and say how he felt, um, you know, what would have happened, right? And then if something else happened, you know, and this was an incident where, where someone uh, was actually threatening him with a gun. Um, and so he really needed, um, you know, intervention and, and he needed to be protected. Uh, and that's just an example, you know, that um, if it, it always, you know, if you're going to make a mistake, make it on the safe side of things. Yeah, we do have a, I have a, a, a list of um, some of these rules and recommendations when worker working with interpreters and we can uh, include it on the on the slides or the website or some something like that where you can access it thank you so much i want to thank you cheryl rainbow project all of you guys for making this space possible to have this conversation thank you everybody take care of yourselves thank you for for being here and, and for for caring to do better work with this population. Goodbye. Buenas noches. Gracias, Celia and Fabiola, for that amazing presentation. And thank you for everyone that was able to attend and join us for this lovely presentation this evening. We are so excited to wrap up our first ever April Learning Series. If you missed any of the previous seminars in the series or you would like to see them again, they will be publicly available in our YouTube channel. We at Rainbow want to extend our gratitude to Fabiola, to Celia for speaking on such an important topic, as well as everyone who was able to participate in our learning series. We want to thank everyone in the audience for being with us tonight. We're so grateful to have you and we hope to see you all soon. So please have a wonderful evening and be safe. Thank you so much.